So hello everybody, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club and uh, I'm very happy to start the second day of our event, AI Traps uh, Automating Discrimination. And first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, the team that I work with that made this event possible. Lieke Blucher, the director of the Activation Community Program, uh, Daniela Silvestrin, Nada Baker, and Monty Harmony, that are our project managers, and Jonas Franchi, the designer, and Giacomo Marin Salta, our PR manager. So I would ask you to do a little applause to them. And thank you very much for being here despite the very strong uh, uh, hot weather. Um, today we have the second part of our conference uh, and uh, also the second part of the Art of Exposing Injustice uh, that is the series that we do in partnership with Transparency International. So I also want to thank them for a great uh, partnership that we are having and uh, that we will still have for other two years. And uh, we are funded by the Hauptstadt Kultur Fund, the Capital Culture Fund of Berlin. Um, and also I would like to thank our other funders, the Riva and David Logan Foundation, the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation. Uh, we are also supported by a grant from the Open Society Initiative for Europe, part of the Open Society Foundations. And we work in partnership with the Friedrich Heber Stiftung. Um, at the same time, a great thanks goes to our partner venues, Kunst and Kreuzberg Betanien, and also the State Studio, that is uh, our partner for the community program. We work in collaboration with the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and also the Agency for Open Culture, RAUG. Uh, our media partners are TADS and Ex-Berliner, and the communication partners of Furterfield and Sin Werkstatt. And uh, today uh, we are uh, encouraging a close investigation of the usage of AI within governments and the public sector, so we will start with this issue. And then we want to reflect uh, on the discourse of um, how AI bias are affecting our society and also the idea uh, of uh, how we can imagine an AI uh, that in a sense uh, um, is not creating a form of discrimination. That is a very difficult task uh, since uh, we will also discuss on the fact that in a sense AI is political. So it's very difficult to divide the discourse between technology and society here and also we wish not to do, because uh, we think that when we use technology, we have always to do it in a conscious way. And the most important thing is really to, affect on, to, to understand and to reflect on the effect on people when we use technology. So I think today will be a really great uh, day about this, because uh, we uh, want to investigate uh, uh, what are the possible misconducts, but at the same time also what is the concrete effect on our everyday life. Um, so, um, we also at the same time, I think that hopefully today we will end also with some positive notes. I don't know, let's see how it goes, because I think our role is also to try to find countermeasures. So, how can we actually solve the problems that we are speaking about and there is any possibility to solve them. And I think that uh, yesterday we already got really great questions from the audience. I'm actually really happy to have you all uh, because our audience is always very critical and very present. So, so uh, I think we can go on with great conversation today. And uh, uh, speaking about that, uh, also I wanted to tell you that we have a little questionnaire that uh, we were asking to our a member of the audience to give us uh, some advice for the future. Uh, so if you also can help us compiling it uh, and also writing uh, what are your suggestions for the future events of the Disruption Lab, this would be really good. Also because as I was saying yesterday, 
we got finally a funding for four years, so until 2023. So your point of view for us is very important. And uh, we will always be funded by the Senate of Culture of Berlin. So please also advise us for the future. And uh, now we start with our first panel, or better, we call it investigation. How is government using big data? So I want to invite on stage uh, Crofton Black, uh, that is a researcher uh, from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, and Daniel Erickson, that is the head of technology of Transparency International. Also, just before introducing Daniel, I just want to give a little note because I'm really happy to have another member of the Bureau of Investigative Journalists with us because we started our very first event in 2015 with uh, uh, having uh, among our speakers Jack Searle that uh, uh, was also working at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, especially on the investigation about the drone war. Uh, so yeah, we are pleased to have another member <laughs> of the group. And uh, now I want to introduce uh, Daniel. As I say, Daniel is the head of technology of Transparency International. And he started his career as a bomb disposal specialist uh, and peacekeeper with the Swedish army and mostly uh, clearing minefield or other threats in the local communities in Bosnia. So this was really an important work that you did. And uh, after this, uh, Daniel has gone on the lead of organization uh, that uh, uh, are working uh, uh, with the technology and the security. And uh, he led the digitalization effort to international organizations, NGOs, governments in countries including Iraq and Afghanistan. And he has been a technology executive in Liston companies and chief executive for one of India's largest corporate security firms. So I am pleased to introduce you and looking forward to your panel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tatiana. And uh, so I will introduce Crofton then. Uh, Crofton has a PhD in medieval philosophy. Uh, he has uh, worked for the last 10 years about as uh, an investigator for, uh, uh, with NGOs and most recently, as Tatiana said, for the Bureau of Investigative uh, Journalists. He's a specialist in open source intelligence, OSINT. And uh, he, in uh, 2016, uh, he authored a book about the CIA rendition program called uh, Negative Publicity, Artifacts of Extraordinary Renditions. His uh, more recent focus has been on um, social media manip manipulation and uh, private security companies and military procurement in particular. So I'll hand over the word to Crofton. Uh, thanks a lot, Daniel. Can I get the slides? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, it's very hot out there. Please, please drink lots of water. It's good for you. Um, so, this is called How is Government Using Big Data? And this is basically some findings that are related to some work that I and a colleague of mine, Jansu Safak, did at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in the last kind of six, eight months. Uh, we, we've published a report on it and some of what I'm gonna talk about comes from that report and some of it is actually, it's not in the report, it's kind of, let's say, new stuff. Um, so, yeah, if you, wanna, if you wanna photograph any of the slides or whatever, then feel free, please attribute it to me. That's my Twitter handle there, Crofton. Um, uh, so, basically, we started about nine months ago with a question, which was, um, you know, what is going on in the world of big data applications in government? Um, and as you do when, when you want to start investigating something like this, we went around the place and we started talking to people in NGOs, we talked to academics, we talked to people who worked in government and think tanks and whatever. Um, and it kind of became clear pretty soon that you know, really no one, and I'm speaking from a UK perspective here, no one had like a very holistic view of what was happening. Like people knew things that were happening in their own particular spheres that they studied maybe. Um, but everybody was kind of in the dark as to what the 
overall landscape look like? Uh, and it's kind of the same in the media. So, you know, we see these stories that pop up from time to time about certain things. And um, Slava, yesterday, he referred to some of them. So there were stories that he put on his slides about Zantura and IBM and so forth. So we see these kind of um, moments where government use of big data systems and predictive systems become visible. Uh, but they're kind of, they're hard to interpret because, you know, we don't really have any context. We don't know if these are like outliers or if these are things that are typical. We don't know if they're like, you know, a norm or if they're really outside the norm. We, we don't really know exactly the, the landscape in which they fit. And in fact, I mean, maybe it's not even, it's better not to say a landscape, it's more actually of a seascape because what we see is like icebergs, you know, we see these kind of peaks that we can discern, but we don't really know what is floating around underneath them. So the project that we did in the last six months was basically to say, okay, you know, is there some way that we can do or at least begin um, a more holistic mapping of this ecosystem of what's going on in big data processing in government. And uh, for various reasons, the way in that we decided to take was looking at government procurement. That's to say, you know, how, how government is buying stuff off companies. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why we did this, but basically one simple reason is that you know, if you're the government and you're buying stuff, um, because you're spending taxpayers' money, there are certain rules about how you ought to be transparent and accountable in terms of what you're buying. And in theory, these rules offer a way in for investigators to understand what's going on. Uh, you know, we've, we've used these kinds of techniques in other investigations in the past, in, in the UK and to a greater extent in the US. So we had some experience of of using them and having some success with them. So I don't want to talk too much about the methodology because um, I, I discuss it in the report at some length. But basically what we did is we, we scraped um, government websites where they put up advertisements for um, uh, requirements that they have for tech services. Um, and we also were given access to a thing called um, spend network, which is basically a big collation of, uh, of adverts of tenders that was put together. Um, it's got like 270,000 adverts on it at the moment. So we wrote code to basically pull out adverts that related to certain things, certain key terms. Um, and we also, we started in this way to build up a kind of a, let's say a network map of like which companies were doing stuff for which government departments. And I'm gonna give one or two examples of this in a minute in a bit more detail. Um, and we also looked in particular at this, uh, this framework, which in the UK is called G Cloud, which is basically like a kind of, it's supposed to be a quick, simple way in which government departments can buy IT services, particularly cloud services and big data services and the like. Um, and it's meant to be for stuff that is comparatively simple, so they don't have to go through a full kind of tender process where they have to create an advert and do a co competitive um, evaluation of different responses to it. Instead, there's meant to be a simple process where they kind of do a search for the service they want. Um, and so there are various companies that offer various services. I mean, there's about 25,000 services that are on offer at the moment. So we scrape that as well, and we put that into our data set. And we started analyzing all of this stuff, um, and our effort was basically to see, you know, can we begin to map the ecosystem of like the corporate nexus between uh, UK public sector and um, corporate, corporate entities. So once we'd done that, we kind of used this, let's say, this kind of open data and that uh, is available in some form or another. Um, we then tried to supplement it by doing a bunch of freedom of information requests so basically, we requested information from, I think, 40 different government departments. Um, and specifically, we requested the audit trail. What this means is, uh, like I said, if, you, if you're a government department and you're buying a service, you're meant to record an audit trail of what you bought and also why you bought it. So if you're searching, if you're the police and you're searching for, say, some facial recognition system or other, then in theory, you ought to say why you bought that system and not some other system. And the reasons that you give ought to Basically, first of all, they ought to illuminate why you made that choice. But secondly, 
there are these quite simple guidelines as to how they should be kept. In other words, um, you're meant to keep this stuff for three years, you're meant to keep it accessible, you're meant to keep it in a place that other people in your team have access to. In other words, you're not meant to, you're not meant to stick it in a box and stick it under your desk where nobody can see it, basically. Um, so the theory when we did this was that there ought to be these quite accessible, simple records of what government departments were buying and why. Um, it might not surprise you uh, to find out that this, in fact, was not really the case. So about 25% of respondents were able to give us some form of record. Uh, and, you know, even amongst that 25%, you know, really some of it was kind of very, very basic and very vague records. Some of it, a few of them were quite, quite complete. 75% of them basically either said they couldn't give it to us or they didn't have it or they couldn't find it or they'd lost it or it was too complicated or it would take months and months and months for them to get it together. There's a whole list of excuses which are quite interesting, but I don't want to really go into them now, but you know, we discussed them in our report in some detail. Uh, so this left us with, I think it's fair to say, a fairly strong impression that there are some basic systemic problems with uh, transparency about data system purchases in the UK. Um, but using the um, scrapes and the open data analysis that we did, we were able to start to put together a few pictures of you know, what's going on, snapshots of certain things happening in different areas in government. So I want to talk briefly um, about what's happening in the Home Office, which is like the UK's, it's kind of Minister, Ministry of the Interior, if you will. Um, so the Home Office is a big government department and it's quite ambitious in terms of, uh, let's say, data-driven systems. It wants to be data-driven by default, in inverted commas, that is their ambition. Um, and they've embarked in the last couple of years on quite a wide-ranging series of programs that are designed to implement this, to like, put data at the heart of how they run their business, and what we found as we went through this is um, that uh, for them to do this, they've basically partnered with more than 40 different companies um, just in the last two years alone. So we started going through the contract awards that had been offered to these companies. Um, I'm just going to pick out a few. Um, basically, I'm going to focus on four different areas. There's um, what they call digital services at the border. Uh, that's one area the National Law Enforcement Data Program, that's another one. Uh, losing my screen here. Um, Home Office Biometrics, that's the third one. And uh, the HMPO, that's the Passport Office, their um, digital application processing, that's the fourth one. Uh, so, I'm just gonna read out to you various um, extracts from the contracts that are linked to specific companies that won awards here and there for these, for these different programs. Um, PA Consulting and Accenture, two big government contractors in the UK, uh, they got contracts to um, automate existing manual paper-based processes supporting decision-making, which was based around resolving the identities of individuals, performing recording outcomes of checks, calculations, assessments of whether a threshold in a points-based system is met. Um, BAE Systems, who some of you might know better from their activities in Yemen, um, they have a contract to deliver digital capability to border force and police to identify and to assess threats who are about to travel to and from the UK. This involves large-scale data ingest and also information and analytics on that data. Triad Group, they also have a data ingestion and management project with the Home Office which includes running something called the HBase Big Data Platform. Uh, Cyrosand, not a particularly well-known company amongst some of these others, um, they offer analytics on uh, people and goods approaching the border, um, what they call it, providing staff with analytics-driven insights to allow intervention where necessary. IBM, uh, they've got a contract to analyze data to identify links between people, objects, locations, and events. Um, the purpose of this, again, in the context of um, border and immigration work, is to set up automated alerts for new or changed data and events of interest. Um, two companies called Kynos and Equal Experts, 
these are working for the passport uh, application program. So they're, they're implementing risk-based approaches to passport application assessments, which results in the automation of low-risk applications with more time for in-depth examination of higher-risk cases. So these are just a few of the uh, contracts and projects that we identified. There's a complete list in the report. Um, and we started to kind of map these out, so basically to look at the different companies that were um, collaborating on different parts of these, these projects. So this one is the National Law Enforcement Data Program. It's got um, the, the company names are in the orange bubbles that you can see there. Digital Services at the Border, that's quite a big hub of material. Um, and then the Home Office Biometrics and the Passport Office, rather fewer corporate collaborators. Um, now, once we'd done that, we wanted also to look, as I said before, at the G Cloud services, which are the kind of, you know, the shorter, supposedly simpler um, procurements that uh, don't involve complex, competitive uh, tendering processes. The thing here is that the, um, the data that we're working with is kind of bad because um, there are transparency figures that are released about how much money a government department has given to a company for each month. Uh, but they don't actually say what service it's for. And some of these companies, like the big ones, like um, Accenture or IBM or Capgemini or whatever, you know, they, they might offer two or 300 different services. So just being told that, you know, they got a million pounds in May is not particularly helpful. Um, on the other hand, you know, a lot of these companies are quite boutique, so they might only offer one, two, three services. So in that case, it kind of is helpful. So there is some value in basically mapping out this transparency data and beginning to see what the ecosystem of services and companies and departments looks like. Um, so these are a few that the Home Office also has been contracting with. So along with the kind of major programs that we were just looking at, these are some of the, let's say, the off-the-shelf systems that it's bought. Um, there's a company called World, World Reach. Um, this offers uh, identity verification um, services using smartphones. So it allows um, real-time biometric and document authentication, liveness detection, etc. cetera. Um, identity E2E, &E, another biometric solutions thing. Uh, they're um, cloud-based biometric identity management solution. We have experience in all large-scale UK biometric implementations during the past three decades, they say. Um, Altius, they have a thing called data science consulting services, which is basically cloud-based machine learning, statistics, predictive analytics. Um, their range of applications includes fraud detection and customer segmentation. Home Office is buying services from them. Uh, GB Group, they offer a variety of services, but their main thing is this uh, platform with over a billion data assets, they say, linking people, places, and businesses. It's used to gain insights into people and their behaviors whilst linking back to the largest independent source of data available. That's their sales pitch. Um, a company called Roke Manor, they offer data fusion and analytics. Um, so their service that they offer is, is they describe it as machine learning, deep neural networks, proven software engineering, fusion and enrichment of data from multiple sources. And this is something we're going to come across again in a minute, which is basically there's a big drive in the UK public sector at the moment to uh, combine multiple data sources. This is kind of where it's at for the government right now. Um, there's also a company called 6.6, .6, uh, comprehensive approach to cloud-based big data implementation. Um, they enable data insight and sophisticated data services in a secure, real-time, and massively scalable way, so they say. Um, so you can basically map out these uh, services that these different companies are offering, so you can see you know, which of the companies offer more services and which offer fewer. L3, who some of you might be aware of from um, their work in um, US uh, drones-related technologies, they're doing stuff with the Home Office. 6.6, um, .6, they offer a bunch of different services. GB Group, they're the ones who offer the, uh, the um, 
big data uh, identity social media scraping platform a um, bunch of others uh, as I said what we can see here is that the Home Office is contracting with these companies but because the companies offer different services we don't know which of those services is being bought um, we can find out potentially through our FOI requests but of course sometimes they don't want to tell us um, what we can do with the data, which is kind of interesting though, is that we can also start to map uh, which companies have relations with, um, let's say, more than one government department. And that, again, gives us kind of an insight into what the overall ecosystem of what's going on looks like. So we can see that, for example, the Home Office has contracts with these guys called Firm Step Limited. Um, and there is also a bunch of uh, city and county councils who are working with them, whereas Chorus Intelligence, uh, who the Home Office works with, are mostly contracted otherwise by police, by different police services and the National Crime Agency. Um, Identity E2E has a kind of a more diverse body of clients. That includes the Home Office, the Prison and Probation Service, um, the NHS, a couple of different councils, local government um, and the same goes for GB group who uh, apart from the home office they have a uh, various police forces um, the student loans company uh, the financial conduct authority um, and even the University of Surrey not quite sure for what reason um, the uh, there's a lot of so basically, the Home Office, as you would expect, shares quite a lot of its, um, it works with the same companies as the police do. I mean, in the UK, obviously, we have like a whole bunch of different police forces. I forget how many, but, you know, 50, 60, whatever. Um, if you start to map the uh, expenditure by the police on these types of cloud services that are offered through the G Cloud framework, um, it swiftly becomes quite a complicated map uh, and this is you know I'm, I'm not going to put the whole thing up on the screen because it basically doesn't make any sense um, but we can again trace some of these let's say slightly smaller in some cases less known companies which have been offering services to the police forces these include um, cloud-based data management services for storing data from body-worn cameras and audio records, um, intelligent sensing and mapping for camera imagery and LIDAR, LIDAR being kind of uh, laser, laser pulse um, mapping systems, uh, internet investigation solutions providing non-attributable access to the internet, nonetheless compliant with legislation, they say, um, mobile fingerprint check solutions, uh, Back to these guys, um, basically one billion data assets, authentication, detection of risk of fraudulent activities. Um, they call it uh, the only service which allows you to capture and validate postal email addresses, landline and mobile phone numbers and information gleaned from social media platforms. Um, and again, services for extracting and loading large data sets into target sources and transforming data for big data analytics. Um, again, these companies are offering these services to the police and the police are buying services, but we don't yet know precisely which ones they're buying in which instance. Um, I just want to finish with uh, one last government department, which is the uh, DWP. The DWP is like Britain's um, social services department. They're a very big department. And they also, like the Home Office, are engaged in a big kind of, let's say, digitization system. It's become quite famous or notorious in the press recently, their rollout of the universal credit system in the UK. But anyway, they um, have said in a letter to a parliamentary oversight committee that they have a whole list of, um, let's say, uh, data-driven um, analytics that they're trying to put into place. Um, a lot of it involves using third-party data sources, which they're fusing, so they say, um, they're also uh, trialing to see how effective different data sources are, including police data, credit reference agencies, 
um, for evaluating instances of fraud or basically building models to predict fraud. Um, they are using new analytical tools to help identify, profile, monitor, and escalate cases for investigation. Again, this is people who are fraudulently making welfare claims that they want to look at. And they're building a common knowledge base of claimant behavior, which supports ongoing risk profiling and trialing new external data sets to risk assess the accuracy of claims that people are making. Um, and while they're doing all this, they're also reviewing their information powers, basically to find out if they can do even more. So in other, as they say, they're looking for opportunities to, opportunities to strengthen their powers while ensuring that they remain proportionate. So obviously, the fact that they provided this long list of things that they were doing um, means that we uh, made freedom of information requests to ask about them. So we said, OK, you're working with third party data sets. Which ones are you working with? Um, you're using open source technologies to fuse these data sets. Which ones are you, which technologies are you using? You're working with, you're doing evaluations of different data sets to see how reliable they are for detecting fraud. Well, you know, what are the results of these evaluations? Um, but in each and every case, they said that they were, un, they were not going to disclose this. Um, so they were, in fact, completely unwilling to give basically any background information on their data activities at all, beyond what is written here. Um, which is kind of interesting, because uh, you could see how, you know, if you ask them for the logic or the decision tree of how they're using this data, then I suspect I wouldn't be very surprised if they said that they couldn't disclose it. But the mere fact that they declined to disclose even, you know, which data set they might think about using seems to me to be quite extreme. So obviously, we're challenging this. And I hope that in the coming months, we might be able to prize a bit more information out of them. So that's basically all I want to say. It's, uh, it's obviously because of the context in which we did it. It's quite UK-centric. So you know, um, I'm hoping that in the next phase of this project, which is going to be going on for the next year or two, we're able to do stuff that is a bit more global in scope and look at like um, what's going on in countries other than the UK. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to present some of our findings and also some of the problems that we ran into, particularly these kind of systemic, uh, let's say, transparency and accountability problems that the area seems to be full of. That's it. Uh, thank you, Crofton. Uh, very interesting. A lot of take-home messages in, 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 in that presentation. And uh, obviously, the, the main one that I see is that the topics that we were discussing yesterday here um, with regards to the, the, the risks of uh, algorithms in society, uh, it's already there. It, the, th these are projects that are being implemented as we speak in one country. This was one country focus. Um, and um, I prepared some questions here, but at the same time as, as we went through the presentation, I, I, I came up with some, some other um, interesting lines. But um, just take the example here with the, the DWP and the, and, the, and, the, and the risk profiling. Um, clearly, if the purpose of an algorithm uh, is to detect who or which kind of category of people are more likely to try to defraud uh, the, the government of um, um, of, of uh, some kind of uh, benefits. Logically, there should be huge potential implications in, in terms of uh, the ethics of of, uh, of developing such an algorithm. Um, but uh, I, I, w I won't focus on that straight ahead because I also see a, a more fundamental issue is that, uh, and coming from the fact that I'm I'm, I'm here. Uh, as uh, somebody from Transparency International, um, it's quite shocking as well. There, there's a complete, not complete, but a, a quite lacking transparency into the uh, government procurement around these these projects. And and what what do you think is the cause? Is the cause the normal incompetence? Is the cause a lack of regulations around the the required? Uh, transparency or, or, or should one be more sort of conspirational here and say that they don't want to tell us because the, 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 the projects are, are too sensitive? It's, it's a good question and like I, I wonder about this myself quite a lot. So um, 
you know, when, when you talk to people who work in government or have worked in government and, you're, and you say things like, well, you know, your, your guys' records are, are not well kept, or why, why can't you find anything? You know, they just kind of shrug and say, well, what do you expect? Um, but on the other hand, you know, the one reason that we focused in our inquiry on this, this G Cloud data, this basically this kind of relatively simple, straightforward framework for quickly buying certain cloud based tools, is that like the whole essence of that system is that it's very straightforward, it's all done online, um, it involves only one or two steps uh, of like how you search for and then evaluate the service you're buying. Um, and it really ought to be very simple for them to follow the guidelines and uh, keep the record of what they did. But even that, as I said, we found like only 25% of the people who responded to us were, were able to produce anything. Um, so, and the, some of the excuses for not producing stuff were kind of ridiculous. So people said, oh, you know, we can't, we can't tell you why we bought this service because the guy who bought it has now left the job and he didn't record anything. Or they said, oh, well, you know, we can't answer your question because we'd have to, like, go and look in our archival backup tapes. Or they said, oh, it would take us, um, I forget how many days, but months and months to pull this information together. Um, and I think that this, this, is, this, is a, this is a problem, basically, in terms of how um, this stuff is being bought. And I would like to see the people who are regulating the expenditure of taxpayers' money in the UK get involved with this because um, I think it's simply not good enough uh, for such a wide variety and a large number of departments to claim that they just have no insight into the purchases they've been making. Um, on the other hand, I do think that when you get to uh, the stuff I was just talking about at the very end, like the Department of Work and Pensions and their kind of blanket refusal to answer any questions at all about the uh, data sources and the data applications that they're using. Um, I mean, I think that must be a matter of policy and it must be that they, you know, they don't want to talk about it. And uh, so far, you know, the Freedom of Information Act allows them quite a lot of latitude not to talk about it. I mean, obviously we can challenge it. We can ask for an internal review. We've done that. If the internal review comes back negative, we can take it to a tribunal. I probably will. Um, you know, it might take a year or so, let's see what happens. Uh, but I think in those cases, there are, you know, unofficially people say there are some government departments that simply don't like answering FOI requests, and I believe that this is one such instance. So, uh, would it be right then um, if I uh, drew the conclusion that although it is really important for us as, as civil society, uh, as citizens, to, to ensure that uh, the, the, the ethical, uh, the, the moral issues surrounding the, the, uh, the development and deployment of these kinds of systems should be taken into account. There's also a prerequisite element in that if we don't know what is happening, then it's very difficult for us as civil society to go in and, and try to, uh, to affect uh, these issues. It, do, do you see transparency in procurement as a prerequisite for the rest? Yeah, I mean, it must must be like, you know, the it's the it's as I said, at the, you know, at the very beginning when we started doing this, the reason that we took this approach is because we kept running into people who said, oh, you know, like, I wish I knew what was happening, but I can't find out. And it's, you know, you know, or maybe I know what's happening in like my little patch, but I can't find out what's happening anywhere else. So that was the whole raison d'etre for us doing this study. Um, and the other thing that it really, I think, brought to light is that obviously, uh, you know, a lot of this methodologically, we based it a lot on open source uh, transparency data, which is like the data that the government releases every month about its own spending. Um, and the UK in particular, you know, I think people, uh, certainly the UK government likes to go around the place saying that it leads the world in open transparency data and basically telling other people how to do it better. Well. I mean, I'm here to tell you that the UK's transparency data is a load of rubbish. Like, it's a mess. Uh, it's a shambles. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's very basic stuff like, you know, releasing 25K spends every month, but constantly changing the column titles or the column orders so that if you try and stick them together to, uh, 
you know, look over the course of a year or two years or five years, you just end up with like, you know, lots of, lots of incomprehensible nonsense. Um, so, you know, the UK has really got a very long way to go in terms of making its transparency data capable of doing the kind of analytics that you need to be able to do in order to ask these kinds of questions. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, so the, the combination of being able to use this sort of transparency data and the Freedom of Information Act and, uh, you know, whatever other kind of transparency and accountability mechanisms are out there is going to be extremely important in uh, understanding what's going on here because really there doesn't seem to be any particularly proactive effort by the government. And there are some exceptions, I accept. There are a few local government exceptions where they are kind of doing their best to uh, talk about stuff that they're implementing. But as a general rule, um, it is, they are not very forthcoming, certainly in the national government. So, um, so um, for us then, uh, the, 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 the public at large, what, what can we do in order to affect this? And uh, obviously, uh, approaching this from my technology standpoint with Transparency International, I see things like uh, open data uh, and open data standards from government as, as being a central uh, part in order to collect data on the projects that are happening, how they're being de deployed, what kind of algorithms. Because also we, we need to re remember here that the uh, I mean, I don't need to know the specifics of, of the UK case in terms of uh, government procurement, but these procurement regulations were set up for transparency into the procurement processes in order to counteract corruption and inefficiencies. Yeah. Now, we have one added variable here, which is the, the ethics, if you want to call it that, or the appropriateness of these, um, these algorithms. So, so what can we as citizens do, you think, uh, in order to, to, to get change in this area? Um, keep, keep asking questions and keep supporting your local organizations that ask questions, I guess. Uh, um, you know, there's, I, I think that, and I mean, maybe a question for, for you guys out here, like is that obviously I've spoken from my, from my perspective in the UK of like what I can find out using UK data about what's going on in the UK, but I'm also keen to hear from anyone else's experiences of other countries or like Germany or wherever, like about whether, whether a study like this would be possible or like how it might work, what it might find. Um, so, I mean, I think basically people need to keep on leveraging whatever data is available and when it's not available, they should be asking for it and you know, if they can't get it, they should be asking their members of parliament to see if they can get it for them. That would be my answer. Yeah, yeah and, and I mean, once again, this is on a way that this is UK da data, UK situation, and UK is just w one big iceberg on its own. We, we, we don't know what the situation is, is, is elsewhere. Um, I don't know if you should open the floor for, for public questions, yeah, uh, yeah. To, to keep it going, because I, I assume that there will be a... I'm sitting here thinking about procurement and transparency. There might be some more exciting questions on the floor. I'm not sure. Oh, you have mics that go around, okay. Hi, great, great talk, thanks a lot. Um, so a, sh a question and a short comment. A short comment in the Netherlands, there's a similar project going on around freedom of information requests. Um, and I'm, I'm not involved, but I can like, tell you more about it. Um, but from uh, some previous work where I was very much involved in freedom of information requests, I would say it's, it's and not within the tech scene or the tech sector, I would say it's a given with freedom of information requests that governments will you know, try their ways around it you know, to be on paper really nicely following the letter of the law, but actually trying their best at any stage to, to stop you from getting the information you want. Um, and, and one strategy we found with some grassroots investigative collective was to try to have as many people involved and just ask for the same kind of information from different angles by different people. Because at the same time, these organizations are often quite large, there's multiple people handling requests, often mistakes are made. Um, and exactly within those mistakes, you often still can get the information that maybe another time you wouldn't get. Um, so, so that's the comment. And then the short question is, um, with your work with Privacy International, how did you find 
like with, with other kinds of similar um, transparency projects? Like, was it differently here where you started to question more about algorithms and, and data, or is it a, a general thing? I, and to, to be f fully frank, I've been with Transparency International for five months, and I'm still warming up, and uh, I, I can't say that I have a, a, a deep understanding in all our projects in terms of transparency and, and procurement. Um, and I've just learned the depth of the UK project, but uh, interest from my point of view is try to develop uh, cross, uh, cross national standards, open data standards, and I think there's some, some countries that have, have made some progress in those areas to in, to in, in order to ensure greater access to structured data that would make this kind, this kind of analysis and a lot of other kind of analysis a lot easier. So I can't answer that question. I will have to answer it to Crofton. Um, Just, uh, yeah, thanks for your comment about the Netherlands. I mean, obviously, I, I'd urge you to be, to be cautious about publicly broadcasting your strategies for better FOI responses. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I mean, you're right that, like, obviously one of the things about FOI is ultimately you're dealing with humans and humans make mistakes and uh, mistakes in the process of FOI responses is often a fruitful, it's a fruitful area. But yeah, I'd like to, I mean, come, come find me afterwards and tell me about the thing in the Netherlands you mentioned because I'd like to hear more about it. Thanks. Hi, Crofton. Thanks for the, for the talk. Um, so, uh, because of some other projects I was working on, uh, I started following the interest in using in this emotion AI and the use of um, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning systems to basically track and monitor, you know, people's facial, um, body postures, voice, things like this, um, to understand things about them and to, you know, have, get data-driven insights. So in reading some of this promotional material from some of these companies, one of the things I came across was... Um, uh, a company saying that the, I, it was not Affectiva, which is the biggest one, but oh, one of the really popular early ones, but something quite like that based in the US. They were saying that their product is so good that in the UK they're using them, using their technologies, uh, because there's a high rate of insurance fraud. And if somebody's, tell, if somebody's lying, it's very easy to detect it from their voice and you know what their faces look like. So the qu one question is like, is maybe methodological, is like, there's got to be some point at which these companies are pushing their technologies out there to government, showing them this is how it works and doing demos. And you know maybe there's not big trade fairs, but then there's some other way in which it's happening. How is that happening? Uh, but also, uh, when these companies are putting these stories out there, I mean, like, w why is it showing up and uh, what does that mean? Are they really using it? Are they just trying to, is it actually the Department of Work and Pensions which is using it or just, some other small council and they're saying the government in the UK, you know, to kind of make themselves seem like they're, um, they've got big clients. Thanks. That this is like, this is a super kind of key question to like the whole, you know, the whole methodology of what we're doing and also to the way that we could improve it and expand it. I mean, like on the one hand, it's a, it's a logical next step to, uh, you know, take the, the companies and the services that we've identified and then to start kind of going through their corporate websites and like their promotional material and you know going going to meet them at events like cogx and whatever and you know talking to them and seeing what they're up to i mean that's that's obviously the best way to move this type of investigation forward um the what you highlight in terms of when you know the, the fact that this is essentially promotional material means that when they say, oh, we're doing X, Y, Z with such and such a government, I mean, it can be hard to know. And, you know, we can, to a certain extent, we can use our data to break down which government department has got contracts with which company up to a point. I mean, the data's messy, you know, all, all this data is messy. So, you know, it's, it's fuzzy, whatever. Sometimes you'll get a result, sometimes you won't. Um, but obviously we, like I was saying, we can't necessarily tell from a relationship between a company and a department which of the various services it's providing the department is using. So it needs quite a, for, for us to, for, for me to kind of do this same presentation, but to have be able to give like much more precise instances of what's going on, I would need to triangulate it with a whole bunch of other sources. So I'd need to like, you know, I'd need to look at like, uh, 
company websites and I'd need to look at like what people who are employed with the company are actually what projects they're working on and where they're doing it and so on. So, I mean, as a kind of open source investigation exercise, it's totally possible. It's just quite time consuming. Um, so it's like the initial effort to kind of delineate some aspects of the ecosystem doesn't really stretch to getting that granular level of detail. But you, you would want to, as a next phase, get to that. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm very conscious that Basically, when we scraped these, uh, the, this, this G-Cloud scrape that I've referred to a few times, it is basically a scrape of like promotional material by companies. So on the one hand, you know, it's interesting to be able to say, oh, there's like X hundred companies offering this type of data analytics service. But, I mean, how many of those hundred companies are actually having their service bought? How much money is being spent? Uh, in the instances where we do know, it's often that the amount of money is quite small, which is kind of interesting because, you know, like, if, if a council or the police or whatever is buying some kind of analytics service for, like, say, 100,000 pounds or something, I mean, that's basically chump change for them. So, you know, what are they, what are they getting? Are they getting something that is really kind of game-changing and interesting and super cheap and revolutionary? Or are they just getting, is it just kind of 100 grand that's gone on some sort of, like, shiny thing that's going to sit there for three months and then nobody's ever looked at it again? And this is a very complicated question because you have to get into, I mean, as you know, like, you have to get into the whole kind of, let's say, the ethnography of how this stuff is used in the workplace over time and, like, you know, how does it, what is the relationship between some piece of tech when they buy it in January to like, you know, next December or whatever, like how has that changed? I mean, this is super complex. So if, if someone's willing and able to spend the time understanding this kind of stuff, then we'd all be a lot better off. Maybe you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks for that. Um, I was just thinking about the title and what I got from the talk is that governments using big data to do what you might expect them to do. You know, I mean, pursue probably what they call anti-terrorism or, you know, look after their borders, look after justice, internal justice, things like that. Um, but I'm, I'm a little concerned when you have something like a talk like this that we're not looking at. I mean, government is probably just actually taking advice from corporate corporations that are telling them what they should do with big data. And, um, you know, it, it, I suppose I wanted to ask you what you think about that, how since, since the Snowden links, uh, leaks, I suppose, you know, we, Snowden kind of told us that it was all government, it was NSA or the bad guys, whereas it's, there's really an industry which is doing what it's supposed to do and government is just using that as, as, as it should. So um, I, I also wanted to ask you, I don't mean to put you on the spot with this, but... Um, you put your email address up there at the end, and I noticed that tbij.com is using Google um, Mail Exchange Services, which means that if I would write to you, then I'd be tracked by the same companies that are then supplying data to the government. Um, so there's a kind of a, you know, I mean, you may not have any, uh, probably, you know, say on that kind of a thing. I know it's something that's difficult in many organizations. But, you know, I mean, if, if we really wanted to, to do something about this, is it, is it not maybe more pertinent to ask questions about how we are participating in um, generation of big data rather, uh, as well as a parallel activity maybe to, to um, trying to uh, track the government? It's a, it's, a, it's, a pertinent, it's a pertinent question. Um, uh, I have a signal number if you don't want to use my Gmail. Um, but, I mean, like, there, are, let, there are people here who are probably better qualified than I am to talk about the extent to which we live within or could live outside uh, this whole complex of um, data creation and data consumption. I wouldn't really say that I am the best person placed to answer that, certainly not in this room. Um, the, my, my view, as I say, is that you know, there's, a, there's a value in leveraging the government's transparency data to understand its networks and its processes. Um, but you know, I totally accept that uh, you know, this, is, um, this is different from 
you know, questioning why those processes might be happening or, you know, that's kind of a second order question because we can't question why things are happening unless we have some record of what is happening in the first place. So um, I think that, you know, one problem here is that it's difficult to talk about these things because there's an absence of data of what we're actually talking about in the first place. Um, what was your other question? I mean, I was, I was, I was making reference to the incongruency of um, talking about um, questions of questioning how big data is being used at the same time as promoting technology that, or, or your organization promoting technology that is specifically designed to do precisely that and nothing else. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I, I guess if I was the um, chief technical officer of TBIJ, which I'm not, um, then I guess, like, I could, I could institute some kind of review as to whether, you know, we should be using Gmail or we should be using, you know, should we all be on Helm? You know, I'd be happy to get on Helm, possibly, like, if I can get them to ship me one from the US. But, uh, you know, these, at, at the end of the day, I guess, um, if you're a small journalism organization slash NGO and you're trying to get things done, then you know there's al there's always trade-offs between like ideal situations and convenience, which you know we can argue here as to like whether they're the right trade-offs or not. Um, you know, I think I think there are pros and cons of having Google hosting your stuff. You know, there are there are some pros as well as some cons, and you know, that's this is possibly slightly going outside the sphere of our discussion, but we can talk about it later. I, I think I could uh, say a couple of words. I think it's a very important discussion. As you said, uh, it's probably a whole other session, but uh, being in the role of being head of technology for transparency, I'm faced with these kinds of discussions and, and decisions. Uh, and that my, my, my philosophy in this matter is that when it comes to big data and, and artificial intelligence and all of these topics that we're discussing here, they're going to happen. We cannot block or ban. We, we have to regulate and, and steer the technologies just like we have done in technological revolutions in the past. Uh, and these technologies can work for good or for bad. And we just have to make sure if we don't regulate, if we don't steer, if we don't affect, every, everything will only be used for bad. And avoiding, I mean, everyone who came here today left some kind of big data trace in coming here, especially if you flew in an airplane, uh, and you know that if you have a mobile phone if if you know if you don't want to leave a big data trace you better move out to somewhere in the middle of absolute nowhere today but i, I take your point as well you know it, it it's a bit uh, paradoxical yep thanks Um, I, I am an investigative reporter, and I actually happen to have spent a lot of time investigating the, the Snowden files. Um, and my question to you is, is about um, when you work inside a newsroom or in traditional journalism, you, you either start with a presumption something's wrong over here, or I have a hunch, or I have a tip, or a lead, or a source. You've started in a very methodic, quasi-scientific way. Um, what was your assumption? What were you hoping to find out? And, and are, you, are you happy with the results? Do you find, because I'm, I'm sitting here still thinking, what is the story? Which an, edi an editor would ask you after one week of this type of activity, and if you didn't come up with anything, you'd say, you move on to the next problem. And I actually, having researched um, a variety of things through these um, documents, often find it useful to look at procurement data because they can give you a second source on something that you actually know the secret part that they won't tell you about, but you can use the public data to confirm something actually happened that you know you have a lead to in the data and so forth. My problem is that often the data is, is useless because it's so vague, the descriptions are you know written in a way that makes it hard for you to do your job. And so more work of this kind would help other investigative reporters. And I have just not seen that many great pieces. Like the, the stuff that was done on renditions was amazing because some people got together, collected in information from different parts of the world, worked together and could prove that these flights had taken place. But is there yet a big story that has happened where this type of data was used in a journalistically um, valuable way? And if so, I'd, I'd really like to know about it. Because if I, if I were to start working the way you did, I would get stressed within a week of not 
you know, where's the story? And, and as an independent journalist, you, you just can't afford that luxury. Yeah, I mean, so I've spent quite a lot of the last 10 years analyzing, you know, these kinds of data sets. And uh, like you say, it's often like kind of a fruitless and frustrating activity. Um, you know, sometimes it's led to great stuff. Like, you know, I was intimately involved in a lot of the plane tracking rendition stuff. And, you know, that, that did lead to kind of quite significant breakthroughs in that. Actually, we're, we're publishing a report, like a big kind of academic report on it actually in like a couple of weeks time, which is gonna be the summation of all our kind of open source researches into that over the last several years. Uh, and, you know, we had some success, I would say like journalistically, we had like particular bits of success with looking at US military data. So we did this story a couple of years back called um, Fake News and False Flags, which was about Pentagon disinformation operations in um, Iraq, uh, which was like, it was kind of a very human story because it was about a particular guy who went out to Baghdad and like what he did there and like, but I mean, the, the essence of the story all came from this type of systematic data mining. Having said that, it, it works better in the US context than elsewhere because the US data is much better, it's much more granular. So, you know, if you bother to go through like US military transparency data like I have, you know, you can, you can number crunch like 15 million records um, and you, you can find stories in it. But I mean, still the effort that you go to is quite great. When you move into the UK context, as you rightly point out, um, there is no, in inverted commas, story that really comes directly from this work, other than the fact that, uh, you know, there are systemic transparency and accountability problems in the purchasing of government tech. Uh, but I mean, there are, to be clear, there kind of, there are stories that we are working on, but I'm not gonna tell you what they are because we haven't, we haven't finished them yet. Um, but they, you know, we, we've been kind of developing our ideas around certain aspects that we want to look at at the same time as doing this, um, uh, let's say, more technical, systemic approach. Um, I am, I'm fortunate in that, you know, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism basically wanted to do a kind of a broad analysis of the area before they started on doing the stories. And the reason for that is that, like, at the outset, we just we just had no clue about, you know, the scope and the scale of what was going on. So it's like the, to take the example of the Zanchura story that, you know, um, Slava mentioned yesterday. Um, okay, so that story comes out in The Guardian or whatever and you read it and you're like, oh, okay, that's very interesting. But, um, you know, you know nothing about the context of it. Is, is that like one of like 20 other such applications or is it the only one? We don't know. So it's like doing this kind of, I, I think of it as like ground clearing, basically. You know, you do some ground clearing first of all, and then you can like plant some seeds and water it and see what happens. I think, uh, do we have time for a last question? Okay, ish, if it's short, yeah. <laughs> a short one. Uh, <coughs> thank you, yeah, well actually I've got a quick, uh, quick point and a quick suggestion actually. One is in relation, I understand the idea about you know, needing to have a story behind this, but actually I think it's very clear that the bigger story behind a lot of what you showed is actually that UK government policy is essentially oriented around targeting. That's the key theme that comes across. So essentially you can read policy off the technology. So in, in one way you can go up from this research and say this is really what the government's about now, is about targeting, paring stuff down, pinning people down, picking people out. Uh, the, the suggestion would be, you know, talking about ways to get other angles on this, since transparency is such a, you know, frequently frustrating and fruitless thing, would be actually talk to people who are on the receiving end. You know, I, I work with somebody who works very closely with asylum seekers and they have a very, their, their experience has transformed over the last couple of years because of the amount of data tracking, data monitoring, data mining that's going on behind the scenes. They're, so people like that, disability, we talk about DWP, you think about universal credit, you think about suicide. Right, these things are very closely related to people's immediate experiences. So perhaps something to flesh this out is actually looking at a few of the groups who are right on the receiving end of it. Yeah, I think that that's um, th those are exactly the kind of things that it makes sense to look at next, basically. Um, and uh, we we have started doing some of that, but let's let's talk about it.
So I really wanted to thank both of you for this uh, great start of our conference. Uh, and um, then we will meet in 15 minutes. Uh, we will have the keynote of Mutal and Condon, Racial Discrimination in the Age of AI. So please come back. And also remember to bring at the counter the little investigation that we are doing here. And uh, if you want, also remember to buy the comics that is on sale on our counter. Uh, that you can also see over there uh, in exhibition. Thank you and thanks very much.